You didn't have to have a cousin Irving in Brooklyn. You just had to pretend it to have a cousin Irving in Brooklyn. <laughs> but you had to be able to smuggle the information out so that the Hebrew Information uh, uh, Society in Vienna could file a legitimate application. Hard to get this information out. So Nick's a smart guy. He figures out a way. Where he writes on tiny pieces of paper all the family's vital statistics. And so, and his wife Sarah sews them into the uh, elastic band of a pair of boxer shorts. And each time a family left Kharkov for the West, he would say, take the pair of these boxer shorts, give them to, deliver them to Hayas in Vienna, and tell them to look in the waistband for all of our information. It took 20 tries before they got out. Nick's a pretty funny guy. He says, you know, there are guys all over Vienna walking around in my boxer shorts. <laughs> They finally get out, they're on a train heading for the west, they get past the Soviet border, they're heading for Vienna. Train stops, and uh, he jumps off the train to buy with whatever few dollars he had, a, a bottle of Coke for his kids. And um, he brings it back, it's the first Coke he had ever tasted. It was warm, but it, I said, Nick, what did it taste like? He said, Steve, it tasted like freedom. They get to America, first night in America, worst day of his life. He lands in Kennedy Airport. They put the family up in a, a Ramada Inn near Kennedy Airport. In Russia, as some of you know, if you've been there, the toilets, when you flush the toilet, the water completely disappears from the bowl. There's no water. That's just their technology. So he's the first night in America. He flushes the toilet. The water comes back in the bowl. <laughs> he says, oh, my God, I've broken the toilet. They're going to send me back to Russia. He spends half the night madly flushing the toilet, trying to get the water to go down. <laughs> he obviously survived because the family now lives in a penthouse on Central Park West. Um, and he's a very, very successful man and engineer. Um, and we're, and he, they also have a condo in Florida where, as he points out, um, Sarah, now Sarah, his wife, grew up in a building where uh, 26 people shared one toilet. And she, he says, uh, in our condo in Florida, uh, Sarah's closet is bigger than the apartment she grew up in in Ukraine. But the other story that I want to tell you, because so much of the story of America today, and, and historically, there are these spasms of anti-immigration feeling. You know, in the 1840s, it was directed against the Irish and the Germans, the 1890s against the Italians, and the 1920s against my people, the Russian Jews, and then in the 1940s, it was against the uh, Asians, the Chinese and the Japanese. Today, of course, it's directed a lot against Hispanics and Muslims. And this is an ongoing story in America. For all of our misty-eyed um, appeals to the Statue of Liberty and our own ancestors, there are also these spasms of anti-immigration feeling. And a lot of it is directed today at Hispanics. People like Pablo Romero. Pablo was born in rural Mexico, where he dropped out of school at age 11. There was no school left in his village. This was the only opportunity he had. He had to go to work. His family needed the money. He went to work in a brick factory where the work was so harsh, as he explained it to me, that he would handle the, these were rough, primitive bricks. And the young kids who were employed there were not given gloves. They just had to handle them in their bare hands. He said, there were many nights I would come home and my fingers were sanded raw by these bricks. And it, I would have to tell my mom on those nights, I, I can't have a warm tortilla tonight. You've got to feed me cold food because I can't hold the warm tortillas. It hurts too much. At 13, his father comes to him. His father was a legal farm worker in California. Comes to him and says, come to California with me, Pablo. There's nothing for you here. So he arrives in California at age 13 and proceeds to spend the next seven or eight years working in the lettuce fields of Salinas, California as a farm worker. Never went to high school. Never went to high school. And uh, that was his life. And then one day, he gets drafted into the American Army. And um, in fact, he gets this notice to come for his um, physical up in uh, Oakland. He drives up, to, he goes to Oakland on the bus and gets his physical, goes back um, to Salinas. And then he gets another notice in the mail. By this time, it was winter. Most of the farm workers had left Salinas. Uh, and he couldn't even read English very well at that point, and he didn't really know what the notice said, except that he figured out, i got to go back to Oakland. Okay. Figures it's another 
series of tests. He parks his truck at the bus stop. He thinks he's going to be home the next day. He gets to Oakland, ushered into a room like this. There are a whole bunch of people in the front of the room with their hands in the air. He has no idea what's going on. He finally leaves. He sees a sergeant with the nameplate Gonzalez and says in Spanish, what the hell just happened in there? He says, you are in the army, pal. <laughs> But it was the best thing that ever happened to him because he goes to Germany, reads every book in the Post Library, flourishes, blossoms there, gets his high school equivalency uh, degree in the Army. And as he's leaving, his commanding officer says to him, Romero, I'm going to come looking for you back in Salinas. And if you are still in the lettuce fields, I'm going to kick your butt because you are capable of doing a lot more. So he goes back home and he files for unemployment and the official at the unemployment office says, you know, there's a program for young Chicanos in our local community college. Maybe you qualify. He goes over there, gets into the program, works all day in the lettuce field, goes to school at night. He's so hungry for knowledge that he, they got to kick him out of the library every night at 12 o'clock. It was a good thing because he had to be in the lettuce fields at 5. He spends two years at the community college and then he gets a scholarship to UC Irvine. And um, uh, midway through his uh, college career, it was midway through his senior year, uh, a science professor comes to him and says, I think you should apply to medical school. He says, medical school? I haven't been to high school. <laughs> and the guy says, Romero, how many Spanish-speaking doctors are there in Salinas, California? And of course, the answer was zero. So he applies to medical school. One of the schools he applies to is Case Western. So he applies here, and he can't get here because he doesn't have any money. He's in California, right? But he also has a trucker's license. So the way he would travel when he needed money or wanted to go on a vacation, he'd get a long-haul trucking assignment. He'd pick up a gig, and he'd drive this truck. He has to be the only applicant in the history of Case Western Medical School who arrived here driving a semi-trailer. <laughs> and not only that, <laughs> not only that, he was stained with grease because the truck, damn truck broke down outside of Chicago and he had to fix it in the middle of the night and he didn't have time to change clothes or buy new ones when he arrived here in Cleveland. Anyway, Case was smart enough to take him, but he decides he's going to stay closer to home. So he goes to UCSF, University of California, San Francisco Medical School. Midway through his medical school, um, he's taking a test and um, he knew the stuff. He was pretty confident. He gets the paperback as a failure. He goes into the into the professor and says, there's something wrong. I know this stuff. The guy says, looks at him and says, you people. You people. You can't do the work. You're only here because of quotas and affirmative action, and everybody knows it, and you people can't do the work, and this test proves it. He's got tears streaming down his face. Please, he says, I, I, this has got to be a mistake. I know this material. At least let me look at the test. The guy throws it at him. Pablo looks at it. Two pages have stuck together. The guy has only read half the test. But because he saw Pablo through the lens of you people, he assumed that he couldn't do the work. So when Pablo points out the problem, the man very reluctantly regrades the test, puts a big A on it, throws it back at him. As he is graduating from UCSF Medical School, he thinks, maybe I'll go to Beverly Hills and, you know, do plastic surgery on rich white women, you know. <laughs> and, then he says, and then he says, no, that's not me. That's not my life. That's not who I am. Today, friends, Pablo Romero runs a community medical clinic in Salinas, California, where 80% of his patients are farm workers. He now takes care of the children and the grandchildren of the families he worked in the fields with all those years. I do not know a better American than Pablo Romero. I do not know a better American, with the possible exception of Aussie Spanish. <laughs>